I'm going to invite Kerry Doherty, um, who's an international expert in the history of Australian space. In addition to the uh, uh, affiliations that are listed in the program, she's also now a member of the Australian Space Agency. So without further ado, please welcome Kerry. For 60,000 years, the Indigenous people of Australia have been using space for position, navigation and timing. But 60 years ago, a new generation of Australians also looked to the sky and uh, wanted to explore, use space to understand the greater environment in which the Earth itself exists. This uh, began what we would now uh, refer to as the Space Age. And I'm going to give you the speed dating version of the history of Australia over the past 60 years as a, to provide some context for all the other things that you'll hear about today. So, the uh, quote you see there from the Australian Academy of Science in 1959 tells us, or you know, indicates to us that in fact space activities probably wouldn't have come to Australia 60 years ago if not for the existence of the Woomera rocket range. Woomera itself, of course, did not exist because of space. It was founded in 1947 as a uh, defence development and testing facility, essentially for the British Long Range Missile Program. But it was in the right place at the right time as the Space Age began. And at, uh, at that time, it was actually uh, managed by the Australian Defence Scientific Service, which many of you today perhaps are not familiar with, but it was the ancestor of the Defence Science and Technology Organisation and, of course, uh, DST, as we know it today. The real catalyst for bringing space to Australia was, in fact, the uh, International Geophysical Year. The IGY was a global 18 months, in fact, although they called it a year, a global 18 months of scientific research looking at the relationship of the Earth to its broader uh, space environment. And as part of that, the uh, United States declared that uh, they would try to launch a satellite during this year. And Australia just happened to be in the right place, ge geographically and geopolitically, to host some of the tracking stations that the United States wanted to construct for its, uh, satellite, its satellite program. And in fact, you can see just next to the IGY logo, that's the uh, mini track station. That was one of these two early, uh, early tracking stations. And they, in fact, this is before even NASA began, but they started a uh, program of Australian involvement in space tracking, which has continued since that time. By 1969, Australia ha actually had the largest number of uh, NASA tracking stations outside the United States, covering each of its three networks. So uh, you can see on the map of Australia there, you can see the different uh, dishes representing the stations, and they covered deep space exploration, human space flight, and uh, orbital satellites. The uh, probably the most famous space tracking event that Australia was involved with was, of course, bringing to the Earth the pictures of uh, Neil Armstrong's first step onto the lunar surface. And these this was done in conjunction with the Parkes Radio Telescope, which has, from time to time over the decades, assisted NASA with its various space tracking programs. What people don't, all, don't necessarily realise is that uh, Parkes also provided the prototype for the 64 metre dishes of NASA's own deep space network. And today our tracking uh, programs continue with the Canberra Deep Space Communications Centre uh, of NASA outside uh, Canberra and also the European Space Agency's uh, Deep Space Tracking Station at New Norcia in Western Australia. And both of these of course are managed at the moment by the, uh, the CSIRO. <coughs> The IGY also uh, brought another type of space activity to Australia, and that was um, literally reaching for the sky using sounding rockets. The diagram you can see there shows you just a small sample of the number of sounding rockets that were launched from Woomera between 1957 and 1979 when the last of the sounding rocket programs ended. The Skylark that you see uh, referenced there at the top was a British uh, sounding rocket. And uh, you'll see there a picture of some young men with the uh, nose cone of a, uh, a rocket, which actually contains instrumentation that was used for some of the, uh, excuse me, Australian research on Skylark that led to some very important X-ray astronomy discoveries 
uh, through the University of Adelaide and the University of Tasmania, working together with the British program. Australia developed its own quite extensive program of uh, upper atmosphere research, and almost all the other rockets you can see referred there are all Australian. So they were designed, uh, sometimes from British parts, but designed in Australia and flown by the weapons research establishment team. The, uh, you can see there the Long Tom rocket, which was the first successful Australian sounding rocket. But uh, it's worth remembering that uh, at this time, Australia was doing a lot of interesting innovation in gaining its own spurs, as it were, for uh, developing the capabilities for firing rockets. And the, uh, the picture you see at the uh, bottom there actually shows a small rocket known as the Harpy, as the Harpy which was one of the first uses anywhere in the world of fibreglass in uh, the development of a, uh, of a sounding rocket. So that was quite uh, innovative in its day. The confluence of defence interest in the upper atmosphere and scientific interest in the upper atmosphere came together in 1967 with the uh, RESAT program, the Weapons Research Establishment Satellite. This was Australia's very first satellite and its successful launch meant that we were one of the earliest countries to actually launch our own satellite uh, from our own territory. RESAT came about because the United States was doing some defence um, upper atmosphere research in Australia and they had brought a number of Redstone missiles to use for that work. Uh, they wound up with one spare and they thought it would be a lovely gesture to donate that to uh, Australia, the host, so that we could develop our own uh, first satellite. So RESAT was uh, launched in November of uh, 1967, so we're just about coming up on its 52nd birthday. The small satellite you see the picture of below is uh, Australis Oscar 5. This is often forgotten, but it was actually Australia's second satellite and the world's first amateur radio satellite created outside the United States responsible for a number of very interesting firsts in small sat development and I wish I had time to uh, talk more about it. During this same period of activity at Woomera, uh, Britain had initially planned to develop um, a medium range ballistic missile called Blue Streak. It became obsolescent essentially while it was in development. Uh, so it was cancelled as a weapon, but Britain didn't want to waste the amount of money they'd spent on it. So what they did was convince a number of European countries to come together with them to create an independent launcher. And you can see on the illustration there, uh, the rocket, uh, you can see the um, British first stage, the Blue Streak, France provided the second stage, West Germany provided the, the third stage, Italy provided the satellite, um, Australia provided the launch pads at Woomera, which were originally developed for the, uh, the Blue Streak missile, and uh, Belgium and the Netherlands provided the electronics and downrange tracking. Now, some people might say that that was a recipe for disaster, but I like to think that, in fact, the ELDO, the European Launcher Development Organisation, made all the mistakes that made the European Space Agency successful a decade later. Despite 10 launches, ELDO was never able to launch a satellite from Australia, which was a great disappointment. However, after initiating ELDO, Britain pulled out, but they actually then developed their own small independent satellite launcher called Black Arrow, which you can see there with the top that looks a bit like a lipstick. And it was responsible for launching only the second satellite that's ever been launched at Woomera. That was Prospero in uh, 1971. Australia was also a very early adapter of uh, what we now call space applications. So we were an, a founding member of the Intelsat, Global... In, in, global Satellite Telecommunications Consortium. And later, this was so successful that um, the Australian government decided that it would establish its first national satellite system, OSAT, which of course we now know today after its privatisation as uh, Optus. Another early area that Australia was involved in was, uh, of course, uh, meteorology, meteorological satellites. You can just see the uh, picture on the lower uh, left there that shows one of the first views of Australia from space uh, by uh, uh, NASA's AS ATS-2 weather satellite. Australia was also a very early adapter of remote sensing. We've already heard that talked about today, using space to look down on the Earth and understand the environment and our resources. And in fact, in 1979, the first Landsat receiving station outside the United States uh, was established here in Australia. But 
a lot of the early space activity came to an end when Woomera was uh, run down after the British decided they would no longer use it for uh, weapons testing and the Australian government at the time decided that it had no particular use for the, uh, for the facility. So there was a, a period of about 10 years from 1975 to 85, there's a bit of a doldrums, but the development of OSAT actually sparked a new interest in developing a space industry. And so what happened in the 1980s was that you had uh, a lot of renaissance in interest in space. CSIRO established its COSA, CSIRO Office of Space Science and Application, which was a, a great force for developing Australia's expertise in remote sensing and even developed uh, instruments that flew on several European um, remote sensing satellites. The Australian government commissioned um, an investigation into whether or not Australia should uh, establish a space industry. This was the uh, produced by the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences, as it was then, and this was the uh, <coughs> excuse me presented as the Space Policy for Australia or the Madigan Report, and its recommendation was that Australia should have a space agency. Um, unfortunately, while the government took part of its recommendations on board, it didn't take all the funding recommendations on board. So it created the Australian Space Office, which was sadly grossly underfunded, um, and asked it to do many things to try and develop an Australian space industry. It had some small successes, one of which you can see in the picture uh, below the Australian Space Office logo was the uh, flight of the Endeavour Space Telescope. This was at its, uh, when it was conceived, a cutting edge ultraviolet space telescope that was flown on board the uh, space shuttle on two occasions. And I might add that the uh, academies have, uh, cho have uh, swiped the original um, mantra of the Australian Space Office, which was making space for Australia. It was also during this period that the first proposals that Australia might provide or might be an equatorial um, launching platform for commercial space activities uh, was suggested. And you'll see there the logo of the Cape York Space Agency, which was one of these early uh, attempts at developing a commercial uh, space uh, launch facility in Australia. Now, unfortunately, in 1996, when the uh, Howard government came to power, they essentially terminated all the previous programs that were space-related and focused um, on the development of the FedSat technology demonstrator, which was launched in uh, 2002. Sadly, that was perhaps the only visible indication of support from government for space activities from that time right through until uh, 2008, when the Senate Standing Committee on Economics produced a very important report called Lost in Space, setting a new direction for Australia's space science and industry sector. And what was so important there was that it recommended, again, for an Australian space agency. Now, again, the, uh, the Labor government that came in didn't quite pick up the EO ball and run with it, but they did, um, <coughs> excuse me, they did establish the Australian Space Research Program, which put $40 million into supporting uh, various uh, demonstrator projects that could, in fact, and indeed some have, lead to uh, viable um, economic uh, programs for utilising space to the benefit of Australia. And this includes, for example, the uh, uh, expertise we now have in space situational awareness. In 2013, we also saw the establishment of Australia's first formal space policy, Australia's satellite utilisation policy. However, again, the ASRP and the satellite utilisation policy essentially were terminated when the uh, current Liberal government came to power. That said, we have a new paradigm which is occurring through this period around the world, and that's what we sometimes called New Space or Space 2.0. And this is a new entrepreneurial movement of uh, young people particularly wanting to take advantage of the miniaturisation technologies and the digital technologies which over the past decade or so have literally revolutionised what we can do in space. We can now build very small satellites that can be launched on light and cheap launches to do the things that once required a multi-billion dollar uh, satellite launched on a multi-billion dollar launcher. And this Space 2.0 paradigm has been adopted uh, 
very rapidly by the entrepreneurial space community in Australia. The uh, image you'll see in the centre uh, below there actually is a snapshot from uh, 2016 of a number of space, uh, new space companies operating in Australia. Some of those have already died, as is the nature of startups and uh, entrepreneurial companies, but others are now going strong and we hope that they will form part of Australia's new space age. You'll even see there the first Australian CubeSats, or an example of one which was launched in 2017. So in this period, the Australian government came to realise that in fact there was a big opportunity here for Australia. Entry costs to space activities to the global space industry were lower. There were now real opportunities for a wide range of Australian companies, small and uh, medium enterprises, to become involved in space. And as a result, at the International Astronautical Congress in uh, 2017, the uh, government planned to announce the formation of the Australian Space Agency uh, or for the Australian Space Agency was announced and it came to being, what's that, about uh, eight, uh, eight, nine months later, a bit like a pregnancy, I hadn't thought of that before, um, on the 1st of July 2018. So now Australia has its own space agency at last after 60 years of, uh, of trying and we're going to enter into a new era of Australian space activity. Thank you.